Hello, I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is the story of what happened to Concord. We'll start with an examination of the sites surrounding Concord in the Fallout universe and in the real world. We'll then move into the layout of the town in the Fallout universe and how it compares to the real world. We'll examine the history of Concord in the Fallout universe and end with a brief history of Concord in the real world. Let's get started. In the Fallout universe, Concord is located at the northwestern corner of the chunk of the Commonwealth that we get to explore in Fallout 4. On the hill overlooking Concord to the northwest, one can find the Red Rocket Truck Stop, strangely located in a spot that could only conveniently serve the dozen or so homes of Sanctuary Hills. A bit farther up the hill, across what I assume is an analog of the Concord or Sudbury River, lies the sole survivor-founded community of Sanctuary. North of Concord and the hills lies the Robotics Disposal Ground, a place where we get some insight into how old or defective robots were disposed of in the Fallout universe, including the experimental combat surgery bot Mark IV. Not far south and east of the disposal ground lies USAF Satellite Station Olivia, a site that served to intercept signals for use by military intelligence before the war, and now hosts a gang led by the raider Akak. -Ak. Northeast of Concord, Thicket Excavations cuts a deep shaft into the underlying Massachusetts granite. While it was found to be flooded 210 years after the war, with some assistance from the sole survivor, the raider Sully Mathis can drain the old quarry to serve as a base for him and his raiders. Southeast of Concord, a Drumlin diner sits on a road to Lexington, occupied by its proprietor, Trudy, and her jet-addicted son, Patrick. South-southwest of Concord, Gorski Cabin, the home of the pre-war conspiracy theorist Wayne Gorski, has become overrun by feral ghouls. Southwest of Concord, Wicked Shipping Fleet Lockup was once home to a trucking company owned by brothers Blake and Tim Finn. The trucks that used to ship goods all over the region, including radioactive materials for the crime boss Eddie Winter, can be found across the Commonwealth. West-southwest of Concord, the Abernathy family has built a home in the remains of an old power pylon where they've made a life as farmers. Unfortunately, they've been subject to raider attacks, including an assault made by Akak -Ak of USAF Satellite Station Olivia, which resulted in the death of Mary Abernathy. While well, in-game Concord is located down a hill from the Pond River that surrounds Sanctuary, real-world Concord lies on the Sudbury River, as the Sudbury River flows north and east past Concord, meeting the Assabet River to form the Concord River. The in-game river flows south and west past Concord a ways to its west. Now let's compare the locations of real-world sites that can be found in-game with their locations in-game. The town of Lexington, the closest city to Concord in-game, is found nearly directly southeast, while the real-world Lexington lies approximately six and a half miles east-southeast of Concord. Walden Pond can be found south-southwest of the town in-game, while it lies approximately one and a half miles south-southeast of town in the real world. Hanscom Air Force Base can be found just east of Concord in the real world. While there's no direct analog for this in-game, I could also find no real-world analog for the Fallout Universe's Fort Hagen, which can be found south-southwest of Concord in-game. With the sites surrounding Concord covered, let's consider the layout of the town itself. In the real world, Concord is laid out along a main street that generally runs east to west, but it is by no means on a grid. And cross streets run off to the southeast, southwest, north, northeast, and northwest. In the Fallout universe, Concord is similarly not laid out on a grid, but there is a general northwest to southeast alignment of its main street. While in-game Concord is fairly densely packed, the real world Concord is spread out across the local area in neighborhoods with copious amounts of foliage outside of the downtown. There is also West Concord, an area that emerged around new mills that were built in the early to mid 19th century. This area is absent from its representation in the Fallout universe. While there is a real world rail line running through Concord, there is no such rail line in the Fallout universe. All right, comparisons aside, let's get into the composition of Concord within the Fallout universe as it's represented in Fallout 4. Concord is host to 49 homes, 15 mixed use buildings with shops and apartments, a hotel or bed and breakfast, or at least that's what it looked like to me. Wright's Inn, likely based off the real world Wright's Tavern. A speakeasy. A bank known as Concord Savings and Loan. A bookstore. Two bakeries. An ice cream shop. A theater. A workhouse. A hardware store. A Fallon's department store, part of a chain that is likely based on Filene's. The Museum of Freedom. A church a playground, two bus stops, a Pulowski preservation shelter, and three municipal plutonium wells. Along with this, the city is underlaid with a civic access area that provided the town with its utilities. Let's move on to the history of Concord in the Fallout universe. A quick caveat here. 
Coming at the investigation of Concord having covered nearly every town in Fallout 76, it's painfully clear how much better the environmental storytelling in small towns is in Fallout 76. This is not to say that there's no environmental storytelling, but it's one of 76's greatest strengths. This is in large part likely due to the fact that for the first year, there were no human NPCs in the game, and all of the story had to be told through notes, terminal entries, holotapes, and what we could see in the environment. One of the other big differences between the towns in Fallout 4 and in Fallout 76 is that 76 started 25 years after the bombs, while 4 takes place 210 years after the bombs. While you can be reasonably assured that it's a somewhat fresh view of these places in 76, there's just no telling how many survivors have passed through these ruins over the past two centuries. I've only done a thorough investigation of the environmental storytelling in Concord at this point, so we'll see how things pan out over the coming series I'll produce on all the towns in the Commonwealth. That being said, let's examine what we can see in the history of Concord in the Fallout universe. Concord in the Fallout universe was a middle class town with an emphasis on its service sector. While there was a workhouse where we can assume that possibly some small scale manufacturing took place, and that some of its citizens likely worked in the granite quarry, thicket excavations, it's clear that the town's economy had a strong base in tourism. There were likely many shops and accommodations for the tourists, but one of the most interesting is the speakeasy. Drinking and smoking were the order of the day at the speakeasy, those upstairs rooms speak to a different area of entertainment for those who visited. The focal point of the tourism industry was the Museum of Freedom an institution that played of the town's historic past and the American Revolution. Inside we can find historical exhibits about the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, and Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. The staff of the museum were known to have some fun in the overnight hours, recreating battle scenes with redcoat figures that ended with scuffed paint and blown off limbs, much to the curator's chagrin. The museum wasn't solely focused on the revolution though, as evidenced by a large mural that depicts American military history up through the moon landings, which were a military operation in the Fallout universe, to the reclaiming of Anchorage. There had even been plans for a Battle of Anchorage exhibit, but these had unfortunately been shelved due to budgetary issues. Part of these budgetary issues were likely caused by an infestation of cockroaches that had previously required the museum to shut down. On the morning of Saturday, October 23rd, 2077, the museum was open for business when the warning sirens went off. It seems that those inside the museum figured it was yet another drill, so they continued to browse the exhibits. That was until the obvious flashes of nuclear detonations brightened the sky. While most hightailed it, the tour guide Megan Hayes stayed behind. She'd only been in Massachusetts a month and she didn't know anybody, much less a good place to go. A vertebrate flying towards West Stockbridge was hit by an EMP, causing it to crash land on the roof of the museum. Megan saw the panicked soldiers it had been carrying flee the site as well. With the curator having fled as well, Megan broke into his desk and stole his gun. She resolved to take shelter in one of the rooms until things outside calmed down a bit. The shockwave of the bomb collapsed some of the tunnels in the Civic Access, killing a few utility workers in the process. In the speakeasy, some patrons decided that if the world was going to end, they were going to go out in comfort, lighting up another cigar and dropping into comfy chairs in the main hall. In the rooms above, other patrons continued their romp until the radiation poisoning became too acute. In the workhouse, one employee, realizing that they were about to die having spent their life at work to the point of being there on a Saturday morning, busted into the boss's office and strangled him on top of his safe, a catharsis for the revelation of a wasted life. A few of the town citizens decided that church was the place to be in the apocalypse, and they joined the minister for one last service. Within an hour of the detonations, fallout began to drop across Concord. The region would likely remain lethal for at least a month until the worst of the radioactive material decayed into less deadly elements. It's possible that some survived the day in the civic access under the town, but unless they had adequate filtered ventilation and enough supplies, they likely wouldn't make it to the end of the mandatory shelter period. Along with this, the tunnel collapses lead me to believe that the roof thickness was not enough to prevent gamma radiation from penetrating the shelter. This is likely the cause of the presence of several skeletons that we can find in these tunnels. Eventually the region did cool off and Concord became livable again. It seems possible that some settlers lived in the houses overlooking the town to the northeast based on the presence of mute fruit plants and a dead Brahmin. But if they were going to make a life there, the arrival of a group of raiders didn't make their life any easier and the homes were abandoned. When Nate and Nora's Mr. Handy Robot, Codsworth, ventured out to Concord, he was shot at, leading him to return home to tend to the absent master's garden. 
When the sole survivor of Vault 111 arrives in Concord in the fall of 2287, they find a running battle between raiders and a small group of settlers that are holding out in the Museum of Freedom. This group of settlers is all that remains of the citizens of Quincy, having been driven off by the Gunners Mercenary Group. Protecting these settlers is the last remaining member of the Minutemen, Preston Garvey. These settlers fled Quincy trying to find a new and safer home. As they passed through Lexington, they caught the attention of Jared, the local raider boss. Jared had heard that one of the members of the group, an old drug-addicted woman named Mama Murphy, was able to see the future. Wanting to obtain the seer, Jared sent men under his lieutenant Gristle to capture her. Though Preston Garvey does a fine job holding the line, he's only one man. And without the assistance of the sole survivor, it's likely that the group would be massacred. Rest assured that I will be creating videos on Quincy, the Gunners, the Minutemen, and the Raiders of the Commonwealth in the future, but this explanation should suffice for the presence of these people in Concord. Should the sole survivor answer Garvey's call for help, they quickly remove the Raider threat inside the museum. Once the settlers are safe, the battle goes back outside. Using the power armor on the roof left behind by the soldiers that fled on the day of the bombs, the sole survivor battles the remaining raiders and takes on a death claw that has made its lair within the tunnels of the civic access. With this path out of town, the settlers make their way to Sanctuary Hills, and with the help of the sole survivor, they found the settlement of Sanctuary. One thing I couldn't find a place for in this section was the municipal plutonium wells, and that's primarily because I have no idea what purpose they were intended to serve. There are three, they exist both above and below ground. I've looked them up online and I couldn't find a purpose that made much sense. The best guess I have is that maybe they were miniature fission plants that provided power to the town, but I don't think that makes much sense either. If you have a speculation, please leave it in the comments. With the in-game history of the town covered, let's get to the real world history of Concord. Concord is one of the most history-rich places in America, so I'm not going to get to all of it, but I will try to give you a basic understanding of things. We'll start by going back as far in history as I have with my videos on Appalachia, 480 million years ago. Around this time, the land that underlies Boston was part of a microcontinent called Avalonia that also held parts of the United States states of Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Maine, along with parts of the Canadian Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, and in Europe, parts of Ireland, England, Wales, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, and Poland. That's quite a multicultural microcontinent. Avalonia had formed as a volcanic island arc as the protocontinents of Laurentia and Gondwana split apart. The granite Great Blue Hill of Milton, Massachusetts is the remains of one of these volcanoes of Avalonia, having erupted 450 million years ago. Avalonia became part of the supercontinent Pangaea between 425 and 375 million years ago, merging with Laurentia in the process. During the Jurassic era, approximately 201 to 145 million years ago, Pangaea split into Gondwana and Laurasia. Laurasia itself split again during the Cretaceous period from 145 to 66 million years ago, breaking into Laurentia and Eurasia, the progenitors of modern North America and Eurasia respectively. Around two and a half million years ago, the world entered a series of ice ages known as the Quaternary Glaciation. Around 75,000 years ago, this resulted in an enormous ice sheet forming across the northern half of North America that spread further and further south until it reached New England about 25,000 years ago. The ice sheet scraped the entire surface off the region, pushing it out into the ocean, eventually leaving the material behind when it retreated, and this material became Cape Cod, Nantucket, and Martha's Vineyard. As the ice sheet retreated, it left behind kettle ponds like Walden Pond, and a thick layer of clay in what is now Boston Harbor. While Boston was ice-free some 16,000 years ago, the ice sheet returned between 12,200 and 11,600 years ago, pushing some of that clay up to form the land on which Boston was first founded. Many of the region's features that we'll cover across future videos are the result of both the volcanic Avalonia and then tens of thousands of years of glaciation in the region. As the glaciers retreated again, the first Paleo-Indians entered the region hunting the megafauna of the area. While the mastodons, mammoths, and direwolves went extinct about 10,000 years ago, the Paleo-Indians persisted, moving on to hunt elk, caribou, moose, and bears. The climate continued to warm over the ensuing millennia, and the forests that would be observed by the eventual European colonists grew on the land that had been scraped clean by the ice. That's going to be the only time we go this deeply into the geological and prehistoric history of Massachusetts. Let's move on to the native tribes that occupied the region upon the arrival of the colonists in the early 17th century. The first successful English settlement of Massachusetts began in December of 1620 when the Pilgrims established the Plymouth Colony. 
Much if not all of the land covered in Fallout 4 was granted to the Massachusetts Bay Colony in March of 1628 or 1629 depending on if you're using the Julian or the Gregorian calendar. Regardless, the land that was covered by their charter lay to the north of the Plymouth Colony, around the modern Boston Harbor area, and supposedly stretched all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The natives occupying this area were the Massachusetts and Nipmuc. I apologize if I mispronounced either one of those. The land these tribes occupied was some of the most fertile in New England, and they farmed the river valleys cultivating corn, beans, and squash. These crops, spread from the south and west, supplanted the cultivation of local plants, though the growing of sunflowers, tobacco, and Jerusalem artichoke crops persisted alongside these new staples. For those of you who've never heard of a Jerusalem artichoke, you're not alone. Apparently, they're a species of sunflower with a tuberous root that's also known by a variety of names from earth apple to Canadian truffle. The natives grew their crops in a fascinating manner that involved the construction of mounds of vegetation and earth laid out in a checkerboard pattern. River herring were buried in the mounds as fertilizer, then the mounds were seeded on top with corn and beans on the sides, with squash planted in between the mounds. These plants worked well together, the corn providing a natural trellis for the beans, while the squash produced large leaves that shaded the ground, reducing evaporation, the growth of weeds, and reduced crop destruction by deer that naturally avoided the squash plants. The Massachusetts and the Nipmuc believed that their ancestors had come from the southwest, from a distant place where their creator had formed them from clay and that when they died, they would return there. This is fairly fascinating as their ancestors had likely come from the southwest over 11,000 years prior, speaking to an incredible oral tradition. Sadly, both of these tribes were decimated by leptospirosis, smallpox, and scarlet fever epidemics that spread across the region in the early to late 16-teens. Unlike their European counterparts that had some immunity to these diseases, they were defenseless. It is thought that as much as 90% of the population may have been killed off by these illnesses. The remaining populations sold their land and parcels to the colonists until it was all eventually integrated into the colony, as were the peoples of the tribes. Sadly, these tribes would not fare well in English society in the long term. On to the history of Concord itself. A small town was established as part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1635 on a six square mile piece of land that had been purchased from the Massachusetts. The land had been called Muscatiquid, an Algonquin word meaning grassy plain. The successful trade agreement was the source of the name for the newly founded Concord. As the colony grew, the frontier moved west away from Concord. The next historically relevant event would take place 140 years later on April 19, 1775. On that morning, the British attempted to undertake an operation to seize the arms and equipment of the local militias to prevent the violent showdown with the colonists. I covered that battle in my video on Vault 111 due to the vault's position on the hill overlooking the North Bridge around which the battle was truly initiated that day. Suffice it to say that the Battle of Lexington and Concord would go down in history as the first battle of the Revolutionary War, regardless of those that claim that the Battle of Point Pleasant holds that title, a battle in October of 1774 that I covered in at least a couple other videos. The town continued to grow after the Revolution, and it became a center of manufacturing, mostly by small shops. In 1808, a cotton spinning mill opened on the west side of town. The wooden structures of the downtown area began to be replaced with brick structures in 1828, and many of these structures survive to this day. In the mid-19th century, Concord was a center of America's literary renaissance, serving as the home to Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Louisa May Alcott, and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Henry David Thoreau wrote Walden while living in a cabin on Walden Pond, a site that can also be found in game. In 1849, Ephraim Wales Bull developed the Concord Grape, eventually reaching the market in 1854. In the 1850s, the town became a center of the anti-slavery movement and a stop on the Underground Railroad. The west side of town continued to grow with the opening of a pale factory, eventually becoming the more populous side of Concord. Though not in Concord, in 1869 Thomas Bromwell Welch produced the first Concord grape juice in his house. This might seem like a striking claim, as in, did no one else squeeze those grapes in the 15 years since they were released to the market? It turns out that making grape juice and not having it become wine is actually fairly difficult, and it requires pasteurization to prevent fermentation. Back to Concord itself, though. A rail line pushed through the town in the early 1870s, and a state prison was established in 1878. Agriculture expanded in the area in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, with immigrant populations transforming the workforce of the area. The population doubled between 1940 and 1980, and with a modern population over 17,000, Concord is a major suburb of Boston. It became notable in 2012 as the first community in the United States to ban single-serve plastic water bottles. The ban seems somewhat strange because it does only seem to ban plastic water bottles, meaning that plastic bottles of soda can still be purchased. And that was everything I could find on Concord's real-world history. So that should do it for Concord in general. 
If you want to receive notifications when I launch these lore videos, you can follow me on Twitter at GamingWithMaps. If you appreciate what I do here and you want to support the channel financially, you can become a patron with Patreon. I want to thank my patrons, Mesothelioma, 76 of Texas, and Jill AWS for their support. This has been the Resolute Cartographer. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again next time.